Hello and welcome to another podcast from Odell Technology. Today we're very fortunate to be joined by the co-founder and CEO of Upfront Diagnostics. Good morning, Gonzalez. Morning, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me at your podcast. Gonzalez, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up where you are today, please. So, yeah, we started in 2017. My brother was living in Cambridge. He was developing point of care devices for uh, one of the main manufacturers of lateral flow in, in the UK. And I was actually studying marketing at the university in Spain. And then, yeah, my, my brother had the idea of, you know, he wanted to create a, a company in diagnostics. And, and we found that there were no any stroke blood tests in the market. So we thought that it was a great market opportunity, although it was a it was a massive challenge. But we decided to to move to Cambridge and and we started uh, Afron Diagnostics, and then we met uh, the third co-founder, uh, Dr. Eduardo Gaude, who is a PhD from the from the university. So that's how so how how we all started. But basically, we we had this idea of of starting the company and. Uh, uh, we were in the climbing wall uh, in Cambridge, and that's how, how we met Eduardo, and that's how the company started six, six okay, years ago. Okay, perfect. Now tell me, what does the diagnostic do? So the problem with a stroke is that there are many different types, and each type of strokes needs to be treated at a specialized center. So for example, in England, there are only 24 hospitals that can deliver the specific neurosurgical procedure for a type of stroke known as large vessel occlusion, which represents around a third of all strokes, but they contribute to over 95% of disabilities and deaths. So what we develop is a rapid test, very, very similar to the, to the COVID test. It takes a few minutes and paramedics uh, just bring this test with them and it helps them to identify those large vessel occlusions on the spot and then redirect those patients to those specialized centers without having to go to a hospital without the specific treatment. And this saves around 100 minutes to treatment, which is the difference between uh, life uh, and death. So it's personalized medicine, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, correct. It's, it's what uh, they call precision medicine. And you're also, you're, you're streamlining care pathways, you're introducing cost efficiencies. Tell me, have you got good case studies of the system so far? Yeah, so we've done uh, different studies. Here in the UK, uh, we did a very large uh, clinical trial in collaboration with Newcastle University uh, under an Innovate UK grant. Um, we tested uh, more than uh, 300 patients and we achieved very, very uh, positive results. Then we replicate the, the results in, in the US. Uh, we did a study in collaboration with a hospital in, in Florida. Uh, and we are publishing the results now in a, in a few weeks. So that's quite, quite exciting. Okay, fantastic. And, and currently we are testing the device uh, in five hospitals uh, in the UK. So we are testing the device in the Northeast of England, in Newcastle, Northumbria. And then we are also testing the device in, in London. So, so there are actually emergency departments today uh, testing and using the, the device. That's fantastic. Is it better that a paramedic has the test or is it better that an emergency department has the test? It can be both, but usually it's paramedics uh, since that's where you can save uh, more time to treatment. So it, it's all about, you know, how long it takes to the patient to arrive to the right center. So the, there is a value, there is value for the test to be Yes. In the AME or emergency department, but the sooner you spot the, the stroke, no, even at the home of the patient, the, the, the sooner the patient will get to the to the specialized center. So but it can be used in, in different stages of, of the stroke. Absolutely. Problem. Absolutely. Now the company is based in Cambridge in the UK, correct? Yeah, yeah. We are in the biomedical campus in, in Cambridge, very close to a few big big companies like AstraZeneca or, or Upcam. Yeah. No, we know it well. Um, I think that what you've been able to achieve in a very short space of time is remarkable. The The test itself is a point of care test, so it can be done in any setting. 
how long does the test take to perform? Thank you, Stephen, for, for that question. So, so right now the results we have is between 10 and 15 minutes. And that's the time to, 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 to diagnosis. It can be lower sometimes, but yeah, 10, 15 minutes is the maximum. That's fantastic. I mean, that's going to save somebody's life. And then, of course, you've got different ways of treating different strokes, and that's the pathway you're talking about. I wasn't aware of 24 hospitals in the UK. That's fascinating. Yeah. I don't think many people would be aware of that. In Cambridge, for example, we only, well, in, in all East Anglia, we only have Addenbrookes, Cambridge, who can treat uh, LVO patients. In London, then you you know we have uh, a few more hospitals, but then the more you go up, the less uh, yes. specialized centers that you have. So in places like Wales, Scotland, there is no there. There are many actually many patients from Wales and Scotland that are transferred to England uh, for receiving treatment, and the same problem happened in, in the US. Uh, so in the US, only three percent of hospitals can give uh, this specialized tre treatment. It's because I mean there are not many. A specialized doctors that can deliver this type of treatment and also you need a very specialized equipment so it's not widely spread and the other problem is that there are no plans to increase the amount of those centers so there is no plans from the nhs to increase the amount of of centers that will deliver this treatment so uh, the only way to to improve the care is is just to uh, have earlier earlier diagnosis that's the, that's the only way Okay. Now the company's received some funding over the last few, uh, the last several years. Can you tell me something about the funding? Yeah. So in total, we've received uh, around uh, three and a half million pounds. Uh, so we have secured a, a very large Innova UK grant uh, a few years ago, and then last year um, the NHS and the Stroke Association and SBRI provided us uh, with a one point one million contract to implement this technology in the NHS. And also we, we have institutional uh, investors, uh, venture capital, uh, mainly the University of Cambridge and Apex Ventures, which is a very well-known uh, VC based in Austria that uh, works in, in MedTech. Yes. Okay, Apex Ventures, quite an interesting company. All right. Now, um, Gonzalez, is there something you'd like to talk about in particular? So I think that, um, you know, a bit of how we got how we got here, no? Uh, I think that yes. for us it was very important to involve uh, clinicians from the beginning. So I think that um, you know healthcare startups needs to work uh, with with professional uh, clinicians from the beginning, and that was part of our journey. So before we start any development, any research, uh, we started working with the team in Newcastle University, and we actually asked them, no, like what 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 do you want? What, which type of tool will will help you, not to to give a better care to, to patients. And they told us that, you know, we're starting to have this problem with stroke patients, so it will be fantastic to have a tool that could actually tell us in the ambulance, okay, what type of stroke is, is the patient suffering? So I think uh, something that we learn uh, from experience is that talking to doctors doesn't cost money. You don't need to raise any investment to do that. And I think that's, a very important part because when you start development you cannot go backwards so when you start you know to do trials and to develop a device you need to know what you're doing no so i think the sooner you start talking to professional clinicians doctors nurses paramedics patients the less chances of doing something wrong you will have so involve the Let's say, and this applies to any industry, you know, involves your customers since day one, and this doesn't cost any money. Uh, so you don't need to raise millions to do that. You just need to spend the time and and, and also be open to be challenged. No, uh, I think that uh, you need to have an open mind and don't try to have all the answers, but try to ask the right questions. I think that's that's super important. So what challenges have you encountered in the last several years while you're doing while you're setting up this business? <laughs> it's hard to mention all of them. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say that the first one is, is is finding the market fit. No, so there are many different types of of, of tests that that you could could develop. So really finding the one that was actually going to make a difference was hard because 
the ones that were very clear that will make a difference were already developed. And then the ones that were so novel, the clients or the customer will not understand them. So you really need to pick something that was, you know, very novel, but at the same time, no one was doing it. I was going to be accepted by the market. And then the second, I think, is uh, fundraising, uh, especially during COVID. There was a moment during COVID where uh, we were in a really bad uh, situation because, you know, uh, um, there was no capital uh, available for us. Uh, although the, there was capital, no, there, uh, and there was definitely people raising money. But in our case, it was, you know, stuck. Uh, we were stuck at, at our homes. Um, we were uh, doing our clinical trials, so we didn't have any data yet. And there was a moment where it was, you know, very hard to manage our cash flow. So those those two things were the most difficult, I think, like market fit and, and fundraising. But if you look at data, that's the main two challenges that every startup has. And those are the main two causes of uh, companies uh, to uh, disappear. Uh, like market fit fundraising is always the, well, it's, it's the main problem. There are other problems, no? but yeah. Okay, can you tell me something about the diagnostic accuracy or the diagnostic precision, sensitivity, specificity of the test? Yeah, absolutely. So we have published data in the um, in in uh, like uh, public journals, so the data is uh, publicly available. Uh, you know, we, we can share the, the details afterwards for people to to go uh, and look at them. But the data we we've achieved is a uh, ninety five percent accuracy for identification of large vessel occlusions with uh, 86% sensitivity, 98% specificity. So we are very good at uh, finding um, the patient that actually has an LVO. So when when you transfer a patient to those, one of those specialized centers, you, you want to be almost sure that, that, that you have an LVO because, you know, it's not only the patient who is moving to a different hospital, it's also the family of the patient. So they need to do a, a longer travel, and you know, like there are many factors that will affect the their lives. So you need to be very careful when you make those those type of decisions. Okay, absolutely. Tell me, have you looked at the cost efficiency of this sort of an exercise, the health economic? So the the we've done a, an exercise. Actually, the NHS uh, has done an exercise for us, and we could save uh, four hundred forty thousand pounds for every one thousand patients that receive the test. So there is a huge cost cost saving. There are hundred fifty thousand strokes, new strokes every year. So if you multiply, uh, you know, the costs are around seventy eight yes. million per year, which is massive. If you look at the cost savings uh, in US, Europe, we could save around eleven billion pounds per year due to, you know, direct cost of reducing ambulance transfers that are not needed, unnecessary CT scans, unnecessary clinicians and nurses involved in the process. But also on, on, on indirect cost, you know, the cost of a patient uh, being disabled for the rest of their life uh, is is massive, no? For for insurance companies, for for the healthcare system, absolutely for, has a for, for, for for the country, no? Because it's people that maybe they are they, they are working uh, and now they cannot work anymore, and also you need to um, help them, no? To 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 continue with their life. So obviously there is a massive direct cost saving, that but also uh, indirect no absolutely i think it has an enormous budget impact um, effect on on a lot of operations particularly particularly integrated care systems is there anything else you'd like to mention so i think that um you know like uh, talking about venture capital uh, in medtech which i think uh, is different from other markets you know like in other industries, especially like software, uh, generating revenues early is, 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 is doable. While in our uh, world, let's call it our, our bubble, uh, starting to generate revenues, it takes a lot of time uh, because you need to go through a very lengthy process. So there are ways of showing traction to those investors that you will make it, but until you start generating revenues, it's a high risk for them, no? The problem that they have venture capital, I think, in this space is that if they don't, if they invest too early, they are taking a lot of risks and maybe they lose their money. But if they wait too long, then those companies start generating revenues. They can start, you know, having deals with the strategic 
companies like you know the Roche, the 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 the, the Abbots, the, the the big companies, and that actually puts them out of the out of the scope. No, so they it's very hard for venture capital in medtech to do to make the right decisions because they need to uh, balance the risks with uh, missing an opportunity. So I think it's a very different world from. I think it happens also in life science, you know, therapeutics. Uh, but uh, there is definitely a challenge for venture capital in, in medtech because there are too, there, we are just too many uh, and it's hard to pick the right ones. But if you arrive too late, then uh, you don't have an opportunity to get uh, uh, you know, a piece of, of the cake. So I think that there is a challenge in, in, in venture capital in, in medtech that I think with you know like all the Cambridge you know University of Cambridge incubators all these signs all these uh, things that are creating traction um is reducing the risks for them but anyway I think it's a it's a different type of investment um um yeah I think that for us the challenge is how to prove that we are going to be the one making it although there are you know there are things that you can collect and, and you can show that 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 um, that will help them to say, okay, I think the you know upfront, I think is the is the right one, no? Absolutely. So, have you started generating revenue at this point in time? So we have secured a, a contract a, with with the NHS. It's is non recurring revenue, so it's just a, a one off payment. A, but we will start generating revenues a, very soon. So a, we will start commercialization. Uh, probably early next year. So yeah, we are we are we're very close to get approvals and and start uh, revenues. So yeah, we are, we are getting there. And where is the kit manufactured? So it's manufactured in, in England. We are collaborating with a third party, uh, and they have a manufacturing site with ninety employees. So yeah, magnificent. Okay, very well done. I'm, I've enjoyed talking to you today, and I hope to talk to you again in another six months' time. You're making a big difference. Thank you so much, Steven.